As a designer, I guarantee that there's going to be a moment in your career where you're going to have to present. And presenting as a designer comes in various forms. Design reviews, workshops, proposals, interviews, the list goes on. And presenting with confidence radically changes how your ideas come across. I sat down a little while ago with Elise Presents to talk all about all things presentation. And what you're about to see is a 45 minute live stream replay that I did with my community members. And if you want to catch these sessions live instead of a few months later here on YouTube, join my community via the link below. And by joining the community, you can join these live streams free, ask questions in the chat and connect with Elise. She's a design speaker and educator for Adobe as well as the founder of Presenters in Pajamas, which is a coaching program for women to help them ace their presentations and build confidence presenting. In this live stream, we cover topics like building your presentation skills and particularly how to approach giving presentations, especially if you're shy or you're introverted or you're really nervous, what you can do in those moments to come across with confidence. We also talk about how to prepare for a presentation, what to do when the unexpected happens, when there's road bumps, something throws you off, you forget where you were going, I've, I've experienced that. I feel like we've all experienced a little bit of that. So we talk about that too. And of course, also how to present with confidence and how to prepare what confidence means and some tips and tricks on how to get you confident and feeling prepared for your next presentation. Join the community if you want to catch sessions like this live in future. Otherwise, enjoy the replay. I have a very special guest. I'm very, very excited to be here with Elise. Uh, Elise is a design speaker and educator for Adobe, as well as the founder of Presenters in Pajamas, a program that empowers women to present with confidence. And in addition to creating YouTube and Instagram content, she's also known for creating virtual education parties, which I would love to learn more about. That sounds so exciting. Welcome. Uh, Please tell us about your story, your journey. I uh, would love to hear more about you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on. And so a little bit about my story. So I, yeah. growing up, I always wanted to be a performing artist and I was really trying that out in my mid twenties. But really what I ended up doing was waitressing, Uber, working wedding parties, nannying. And I was like, I'm not going to be touring with Lady Gaga anytime soon here. <laughs> so like I need to switch gears. And that's when I found UX. Um, so yeah, that was in 2015. I found UX and I took the boot camp at General Assembly full-time program. And a couple months later, I landed my first job at W Promote, a digital marketing agency. And I was the mm. first UX designer there and I built and grew a team there. And a year later, I started an agency with my General Assembly instructor, a UX agency, and one of our clients was Adobe. And from that, when I started to create YouTube videos and stuff, some people at Adobe had seen it and they were like, hey, do you want to do some live streams? I'm like, okay. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that kind of like started like started this whole thing about me with me like presenting on camera and educating and I became part of the Adobe XD enterprise program. So I teach enterprise clients how to use Adobe XD, but I also am part of their live streams where I do live streams and, and teach the broader audience as well. And then from there, I was like, you know, I am kind of feeling like I'm leaving you the UX world and I'm mm. like entering something new. I felt like it was in my body, like something's, I think I feel the change coming this year, 2022. I'm ready for change. Yeah. And um, what came up was I realized I love talking about presenting. I love reading about it. I find that what I spend most of my time and energy on is where I should kind of lean towards. So all I'm reading tons of books and really engaging myself in presenting and storytelling. And I was like, oh, maybe I could help other people with this as well. And so that's kind of basically what I'm doing now is, is really leaning into helping people with their presentation skills and thinking more about how people can feel less in their head, more mm. and more present in their presentations. And that's my whole, I'm very I'm quite spiritual. I meditate a lot. So it's really about like, how do you, how do you kind of feel more confident from the inside out? Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Uh, building that confidence from the inside. Uh, I feel like 
as a designer, you know, we've got a lot of designers uh, tuned in listening to this. Um, presentations are a big part of the role. <laughs> I didn't realize going into this field how much time I would spend making presentations, giving presentations. It's like such a important medium, I feel, as a designer for communicating your ideas, getting stakeholder buy-in, things like that. Um, I'm wondering, uh, for the folks tuned in, uh, community members, how confident do you feel today about your presentation skills? Maybe you can give us a little uh, scale in the chat from one to five, one feeling like absolutely zero confidence and five feeling like super, you know, superstar confidence level, uh, just to get a sense of how people uh, tuned in today are feeling in regards to their confidence level. Um, I would say that I definitely started at a zero. Uh, or like at a one in my career um, but I'm probably today feeling like a three four like I feel like I've done it enough times to learn how to improve and really communicate and articulate myself well but know that I could probably be doing a lot better I see some numbers coming in three one three four two felt more confident at my last job like an eight feeling at a five okay so you were feeling more confident in your previous job it is scary when you join a new place. I feel you have to build that confidence back up. Um, cool. Thank you so much, everyone, for sharing. And what about you for like, what made you feel, what was the thing that made you feel most confident, you think, from your presentations? Yeah, I do think having that like baseline of like psychological safety with your team, right? Mm -hmm. Which is where like, if you're new to a company, you don't really know everyone very well. Um, so I think more time and role uh, helped me feel more comfortable with the people I was presenting with. Um, mm. and I think also for me, I'm very much a, uh, how do I say this? Like, I like to practice a lot, like physically practice. So yeah. I will like speak my presentation out loud as if I'm presenting it in order to practice. Um, and that's really, really helped me prepare for my presentations and feel more confident delivering the message because I feel like when I'm verbally practicing, I can trial a few different ways of, of saying something or sharing a message. Um, so that's been helpful for me. And then lastly, I've done a public speaking course or two, which is also very helpful when it comes to presenting, obviously, public speaking and, and presenting. Um, so yeah, I feel like I've learned a few tips and tricks through that too that's helped me. Yeah, it's amazing what like when you actually verbally practice, how much more you learn from that than what you've written out or an outline. Because when I'm practicing, I'm like, oh, that's awkward. Or like, that didn't flow right. Yeah. Or you learn something new. You're like, oh, I want to add this. Like, because it just felt more, it felt like it, it flowed better when you were just speaking it out. And then you have all these different new ideas that you can add to it as well. So I think that's a really important piece. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Uh, for the listeners tuned in, if you have any questions throughout the stream, Feel free to pop them in the chat. Mark them as a question. We're going to save some time for Q&A. Uh, but let's let's kick it off with sort of the topic of like building your presentation skills, right? Yeah. Um, I know a lot of folks uh, probably feel more on the introverted side, right? And when you combine presenting, public speaking, uh, this can be really challenging for some, some people. So for someone who is introverted, maybe they're shy or they experience stage fright, things like that. Um, yeah. What's your advice for them to build confidence and build these presentation skills? Yeah. You know, the, this last group that I had that I was working with. So of, of the seven women, I would say five identified as an introvert. And so it was interesting to watch the evolution from, from, their perspective. And, and we've chatted back and forth on, on reflection of this experience. And one of the things that was a big factor was they, the willingness to be uncomfortable. So mm. something that I recommend that anyone can do at wherever they're at is to start with little things, to start feeling a little uncomfortable, pushing yourself a little bit with whatever that means for you, whether it's on the street, I start to smile at people instead of just looking away, right? That might be something that makes me a little uncomfortable, but yeah. I'm practicing that. 
So when you start practicing things in your day to day that make you a little uncomfortable, you start kind of leveling up, right? How, how uncomfortable things are for you. Now you're like, oh, I could smile at anyone at, at all at all <laughs> times on the sidewalk. Now you're going to maybe level it up a little bit. Maybe you're going to strike a conversation with people on the side on the sidewalk, whatever it is, right? You, you kind of consistently level up. And there you start to build that capability and understanding of, oh, I can push myself and I feel confident that I can do more things that I thought I wasn't capable of. Mm. And so in my group, we were doing things and a lot of presentations and um, understanding ourselves and being vulnerable in ways that made them feel uncomfortable, but in a safe space that they continued to practice and then we're like, oh, yeah, talking to my stakeholders about my design is kind of like not such a big deal anymore because I've been practicing this. It's like a flexing a muscle, right? Flexing, flexing that uncomfortability muscle. Yeah. Um, yeah. And how, how might like, let's say a designer, how might they create that space to practice? Like whether it's on their team or, or outside of their team, how do you kind of create that environment? Do you have any suggestions? Yeah, I think that. You can find ideally, you know, people in your team that you can ask, hey, do you do you want to practice this presentation beforehand? Can I get your feedback? Yeah. You know, spend some time on a call together. You can do it with some friends. You know, I had someone who would just practice with anyone that was willing to <laughs> listen to them, just like practicing that. Yeah. I practice with my husband. Um, and of course, you can also find like a more formalized group. If you're like, I don't know anyone I could practice with. I don't feel comfortable with anyone around me. Then maybe you can try to look for a group. Obviously, I have a public speaking group, but there's also Toastmasters mm -hmm. as well that you can, that is a nonprofit that you can look into. So there's different avenues that you can go into if you want something more formalized as well. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of different options. I like the idea of like asking around in your team, if there's anyone who wants to practice with you or chances are yeah. like, you're not the only person, right. Who maybe is struggling with this or wants to improve in this area. Mm -hmm. So I think just asking and seeing who else might also want to work on these skills and maybe you can work together. Um, that's really helpful to have like a buddy that you can sort of gut check things with or like practice with, uh, I feel like is really valuable. 1000%. I mean, the other thing that I found was most valuable for, um, for people is that oftentimes we have certain things, experiences in our life that have that have made shaped us in a way that makes us feel not confident when speaking. So it could be different for every person. For me, having a mother who had English as a second language, she would always say, you have to speak great English in order to move up. In the right. world. So I thought I need to be perfect. I need to have to be the most articulate person for people to respect me. Um, not not going to college, having a boyfriend that made fun of me for not going to college, that really affected me and yeah. the way I thought people received my, my information. So really kind of, instead of escaping those, I, those experiences is to really dive in and think about them. And you, it's called like opening the wound. Yeah. <laughs> and then you heal the wound. You think about what are some of the good things that came out from this experience? What are the lessons that I learned? And what is the advice I'd give myself now, my current self? How would I, my current self, give my past self advice, right? Looking at it from a different perspective and really kind of heal those little wounds so you can move forward as well. And that's also pretty impactful. Yeah, that self-reflection is so important. Uh, why, yes. why should designers invest in their presentation skills? I mean, I talked a little bit at the beginning about how I feel like as a designer, presentations mm -hmm. are a big part of my job. Um, but from what you've seen in the designers that you've, you've coached or talked to, um, what are some of the benefits by investing in their presentation skills? There are so, so many benefits to being able to articulate yourself. One of the things I think about is like, you know, you, you might have such great ideas, right? But if you can't articulate it, the world will never know yeah. about it. And that's really sad. Um, the other thing that's kind of strikes home for a lot of people is just like, oh my gosh, I hope they don't. I hope they don't like ask me to do a presentation. Oh, please don't call on me, right? Uh. Having that fear and anxiety at work is somewhat debilitating, 
right? And but inside you know, oh, I have so much to share. I have so much to give. I have some great ideas, but you there's a block between between your great ideas and being able to communicate it. And I think that it's so important to, you know, when we're wanting to get hired, being able to communicate who we are, what we have to offer, when we want to move up in our companies, when we want to, especially now with Zoom is everything, right? So we're kind of presenting whether we know it or not. Like yeah. <laughs> even if we're like doing a stand-up, we have to talk about what we're doing and working on for the day. So it's a constant thing. And if mm -hmm. you're fearful of it, you're you instead of working on it, you're finding more and more way, I guess more and more touch points of fearing public speaking. And it becomes bigger and bigger and greater and greater and scarier and scarier as time goes on. And so it's just like, let's just break through and just like address it as soon as possible and start to like move forward in our lives and find our voice and be able to use it the way we want to, to get yeah. what we want. Yeah. I've definitely noticed in my career, the designers who do have strong presentation skills are better able to like communicate their ideas, their design decisions, better convince stakeholders and get buy-in on their projects. Um, and I feel like I'm, storytelling is a big part of this too, right? Like being able to like bring your audience along on the story and, you know, have your information be really easily digestible. Um, is is super important and I've definitely seen the designers who are good at that kind of accelerate a little bit in their career and in their projects sort of like unlock something yeah. oh 1000 percent. I think that the reason why I was able to go from not knowing anything about tech to going and in, getting into UX moving yeah. up into director role moving up into you know co-founding an agency within one to two years was because of my presentation skills mm -hmm. was because of the way I could communicate um, was I super confident internally no but I had some <laughs> abilities I, I was able to do it because of my performance background like all of that helped yeah. shape me and who I was and, and helped propel me forward yeah, totally. Yeah, I'm jealous of your performance background. If, if only all of us <laughs> designers had that background, we'd maybe come across more confident. Um, what what makes a bad presentation in, in your perspective? I also want to touch on what makes a good presentation, but maybe we can start with the, the bad and the ugly. Um, yeah. I think that what makes a bad presentation is, I guess there's, there's the actual presentation slides themselves when there's too much information, mm -hmm. not enough imagery, mm -hmm. but also too much detail in general is, is not the way to go, depending on who your audience is. So when we're thinking about stakeholders who have limited time, they're thinking about a lot of things at the time. You don't want to like, when we think storytelling, sometimes when I've, I've said, okay, we need to get better at storytelling. People take that as like, okay, so let me give a lot of detail. Like, let me right. give a picture. Like it was a cold, rainy day. Like, no, <laughs> we don't, we don't need all that detail. We actually have to strip away a lot of details. Deep stories don't have to be long. They could be really short stories. Yeah. They just have to be surprising and engaging. Right. So I think that one of the things is, is really stripping away and understanding what is the right information to keep and what is the most impactful information to keep so that it keeps people's attention. Um, that's one of the biggest things. I think also just like people think, I think when, when they're doing anything with work, they think I have to be like this. I have to be really <laughs> corporate and, and like monotone <laughs> and serious. But instead, it makes people feel a little uncomfortable mm. sometimes. Mm -hmm. So thinking about just like your facial expressions, your gestures, your body language, opening it up, showing your personality actually makes people trust you more. Yeah. So people think they have to shy away and hide away, but in actuality, you want to open up and show more than you think, right? So yeah. I think that those are some things that help help kind of make a, a better presentation. Yeah, you're, you're so right. I feel like it's so refreshing when the presenter is like really animated and engaged and like hyped. Uh, it just totally changes the mood in the room, in the virtual room too. Uh, so I feel like that's so important. Um, also what you were mentioning around like considering who your audience is, I think is so, so important. Uh, I remember a time when 
we were giving a, uh, I think we were doing a little review um, where we wanted to get like VP product level feedback on our project. Uh, And I remember presenting the sort of two ideas and two directions we had. And I guess I must have started going too much in the weeds because this VP sort of cut me off and was like, I get it. You don't need to go into the details move forward like keep moving forward and in that moment I was like oh my god like you know I I got I got stressed and I was worried and like lost my confidence but then at the same time when I reflected back on it I was like that was a really good lesson actually for Mm me um to to like learn you know okay consider the audience this is a VP of product I don't need to spell it all out they get the gist really quickly they just need the high level you know, takeaway, not not the, the the details of the weeds. Um, and so that was a good lesson for me. I think since then I've really thought about who is the audience, how much detail do I need to go into, um, and what is really the goal of this presentation? Like what 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 do we want to end with? What do I need to get out of this? And how can we get there as quickly and efficiently as possible? Yeah, that's great. And I also love how you're even opening up that wound, talking about (laughs) healing from that. What's that learning lesson and moving forward and using it as it's it's funny because like, so I do volleyball and I take volleyball lessons and I have a coach who does like, uh, who really, who really like gives me feedback in real time, like move your shoulder, this do that. Right. And like really helps perfect it. And I love getting this feedback, but the thing that's different between that and like public speaking is when you're giving someone feedback, you suddenly feel so much more sensitive. There's a stark difference between (laughs) your physical body, like in sports versus getting training for public speaking. And so Mm -hmm. it's, it's funny because I think about that and like how we, we can try to be less sensitive and think about it more like a skill that we're just trying to grow and learn it and think about being a designer and just trying to level up and just trying to improve and iterate on ourselves and, and try to take a step back from being so emotionally tied to any type of piece of feedback being like, okay, great. That's, that's a great learning lesson. Let's move forward. Yeah. Let's move forward. Yeah. Especially in the context of a presentation, I feel where it's a group of people often, right. It's not often like a one-to-one it's like in front of everybody. Um, But yeah, I think just taking, it like taking the high road with it and and moving forward uh that's what I did uh okay what about what makes a good presentation then what what's an example maybe of a really great presentation you've seen or some common you know things that you've seen in in good presentations I think that one of the main things that is somewhat one of the hardest things for people is to be present in your presentations what who would have thought when you're (laughs) present Right. And you're engaged. Yeah. And you you're not trying to rush through it. You're not trying to just read off of the notes that you're having. You're just reading it word for word. You're actually present and interested in what you're saying and interested in what you're sharing to other people. So I think that's really the second part is being engaged and being excited with what you're sharing. You're passionate about what you're sharing. And passion is contagious. So I think that. When we think about what is what is really the thing that connects us to our work or what is the thing we're excited to share with the company, our team, or stakeholders, to really feel connected to that and try to be as present as we can in those presentations. And so I, I always tell everyone to try and do a 10-minute meditation beforehand, mm. do breathing exercises beforehand, vocal warm-ups. I have a whole routine to calm my body to calm, to calm my mind and to really feel like I'm I'm actually I'm here and I'm ready and I'm when you're when you're doing that too you're you're able to when when people throw something off the, out of out of that you weren't expecting a weird a question that you weren't expecting or maybe yeah. there's some interesting chat that's happening or maybe you made a mistake all of those things become a lot more manageable when you are present and, and you're able to receive and give back and be able to think through things in, in real time. Yeah. I also feel like by being present, you better capture the attention of your audience. Um, it's it's really obvious when someone's not present or not like speaking from the heart, I guess. Like you can tell they're reading a script or they're just like saying exactly what they've been told. Um, and it's not as engaging or, or as exciting uh, as a as an audience of, of that presentation. Um, you also brought up around like those unexpected moments, those road bumps, like 
a question gets thrown at you and you don't know the answer or there's something distracting happening, uh, this is bound to happen at some point, right, uh, in, in folks' career. So uh, what do you do in those moments? Yeah, so something that I tell people that is helpful but also scares people is that <laughs> there is no avoiding mistakes. They're going to happen. Mm -hmm. right? So we need to just set ourselves up for that expectation. We need to have realistic expectations of life. Mistakes happen. Things happen. We're human, right? So what we want to think about is what are some tactics for dealing with mistakes or challenges that come up? And one of the things that you can think about is like whatever you are experiencing as the presenter is what the audience is going to be experiencing. It's, there's not much of a gap there. If you're feeling not present, they're not present. If you're feeling excited, engaged, they're feeling engaged. If you're like, oh my God, I messed up. This is so awkward. Oh my God, guys, this is, oh, oh no. Uh, <laughs> right. And suddenly your audience is like, oh God, this is so awkward. Get me out of here. I want to get out. Right. Or, but if you're like, oh, oops, I made a little mistake. You make a little joke. Anyways, let's move forward. Right. They're going to be like, oh, she made a little mistake. Ha -ha. And let's move forward. Right. So yeah. they are going to follow you along. And something that I tell uh, people that I'm working with is when you make a mistake, make a make a note of it, make a joke of it and just move forward. Just keep on rolling forward. That's all you can do. And the audience will forget, like they won't remember that big, that mistake or something that seems so big to you is probably not very big at all to them because of the way you reacted to it. So we kind of just need to keep on rolling through. Yeah. Um, that's, that's the biggest thing. <laughs> have you, have you ever experienced where that whatever distraction happened threw you off so much that you forgot where you were or you like lost your place? So, like I, I've definitely been in that situation and tried to like fake my way through to make it appear that I know what I'm doing. Oh, yeah. But yeah. What do you do in that situation? <laughs> yeah. One time I was doing a live stream with a couple hundred people and like, I literally blanked out. <laughs> I wasn't sure if there was something going on because I had just taken a prescription medication that week or what, but like I literally had no idea what I was saying or what I was doing. Yeah. And so I just, I, I had to say it during it, like, oh, I am so sorry. Like I blanked out. Um, <laughs> let me just like collect myself, like, hold on. And I make it a joke about it. Like, oh, okay, so let me find myself. And I got to the next slide and then I, I continued moving yeah. forward. Um, mm -hmm. Luckily you have a slide, you have notes. So it's gonna help kind of like bring you back to where you're at. The other thing that I've done is sometimes I'll make a mistake. This was in the past, I'll make a mistake and I will like dwell on it the entire rest of the presentation. Like, uh, right. again, I'm not present. I'm in my mind replaying yeah. that incident in my head over and over for the rest of the whole presentation, which, which is making my presentation definitely not as good. So something that I do, a meditation practice is, is called like the bubble where you, you put a thought into the bubble and you just like relinquish it away. So I put that feeling, that thought into a bubble, like I visualize it in a bubble and I like mm. send it away. And I'm like, I'll come back to you in 30 minutes if, if we need to, we need to address this. Otherwise I cannot have you in my psyche, in my Aura. Um, yeah. <laughs> aura and, and affecting my energy for the next 30 minutes. Be gone. So that yeah. is, is a, another practice I do. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm loving all the like little like meditation kind of drops into this, um, which makes so much sense. Uh, I'm curious, like ha what are, if any, some common ticks, I guess, that you see in presenters? Like, is there anything that you often see people people like commonly trip up about or like, oh, people always do this when like instead they should be doing this. What are some like maybe quick wins of common, common mistakes, quote unquote, people do in presentations? Yeah. Some things I've seen are people do rush through. Um, so, oh, hey, I'm so-and-so we're going to be doing this and this is where I'm, you know, um, we're going to be working on today and then tomorrow. So they're, they're <laughs> rushing through it and it feels like, um, you probably you even hearing it makes you feel a little anxious, yeah, like yeah. listening to it. So that's one of the common things that you hear. And so instead of just like taking a breath beforehand, finding more places to take deep breaths and pause mm. is good. And to also, um, uh, 
slow down is one of the big <laughs> things is just verbally slow down. I've had, I've had to work with people where I ask them to record themselves, replay it and listen to themselves because they are not aware of how fast right. they're going. It's, so and hard even to though tell. Like, it's hard to tell when you're in the moment. Mm. And so what we've done is just practicing. Okay. Give, give me half speed, even more half speed, even <laughs> more half speed. So like really slowing things down to start to feel more present. That's one thing. The other thing is the monotone. So not having any vocal variety. So we want to think about how can we have more higher tones, a little bit more lower tones? How can we think about color words? So thinking about like, if we're saying powerful, right? We want to emphasize powerful instead of just like, that was a very powerful presentation. We want to, that was a really powerful presentation. It mm. starts to bring people closer into engaged with what you're saying. I did a lot of vo voiceover work too back in the day. So I'm very aware of my voice. And that's something I recommend to people is even just listening back to their voice and, and not looking just for what's negative, but to also look for what's positive. What is something good about my voice? What are things, what are my natural strengths? And then where are some areas that I have opportunity to grow in? So um, that's, that's another, that's another piece. There's a lot that I could go on, but yeah. those, those are a couple. <laughs> no, that's a great start. I, I feel like I often hear people hate listening to their own voice. Uh, as a content creator, I'm sure like me, like I'm so used to hearing my own voice all the time. Uh, so it doesn't bother me anymore, but I, I know a lot of people have trouble listening to themselves. <laughs> oh yes. Oh, definitely. Um, I was working with someone recently. She hated her voice. She also hated that she had an accent. Um, mm. And she recently was like, you know what? I now learned no more self-loathing about my voice. Like this is my voice and mm. I'm going to use it. It's going to empower me. One of the things that you can do just like you and I are doing is exposing yourself to your voice, listening back to it, kind of starting to desensitize yourself. And again, yeah. looking for what's positive helps with that. And if it's too much to think like, oh, I need to be critical of my voice, just really think about just kind of maybe playing it in the background when you're going to the bathroom, <laughs> just be playing it, exposing yourself and then being like, Oh, what's, what do I like about this? Okay. Right. So, it, you know, just, just that exposure is really helpful. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Uh, let's talk a little bit about confidence and imposter syndrome. Um, any tips for coming across as confident when presenting to stakeholders or trying to be more convincing in your presentations? Maybe you're trying to sell an idea or get buy-in for something. Any advice for how to do that? Yeah, I think that one of the things that we need to think about is, is just the fact that they are human beings as well. Yeah. And um, <laughs> something that I did in a presentation today that I was talking about is, is, is finding the dirt on people online. This is the most <laughs> childish tactic, but well, hear me out. So the more you humanize other people, the more you're going to feel like, oh, we're the same. We're just human beings. Right. And so my, my husband had a boss who was really stern, who was really flat, and he really felt a big divide. My husband found a blog from uh, the, his boss's wife. And the wife would refer to her husband as hot hubby throughout this <laughs> blog. And we were like, oh my gosh, hot hubby, you have to be kind of a teddy bear, like a lovable teddy bear to be called hot hubby. And in the <laughs> blog, you see him taking care of her when she's sick. It just really humanized him mm, for us. And we saw him in a completely different light. So I'm like, okay, fine, you know, find a little dirt on people online. Not dirt necessarily, but find, you know, there's a lot of things. A way online. to humanize them a little <laughs> bit more. Yeah. 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 Maybe it's through conversation. Maybe it's going through co to coffee, going to work events and being able to strike a conversation. But if that feels uncomfortable, maybe there's things you see them, you know, see them doing uh, wine, wine nights with their girlfriends and you're just like, okay, they're just like a regular human being. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so internally having like a similar playing fields, like there's that. Um, I think also the body language and voice control, like 
when you have control over your body, you're self-aware of what's going on here. And instead of being like, hi, um, you know, I'm feeling like, right, if we can start to open up our body, use gestures appropriately, have voice control, all of those things are signals to other people that you feel confident and that they want to engage and want to learn more from you. The other thing is storytelling skills and being able to structure your presentations and the way you talk to people with um with a lot of forethought. So something I talk about is like luring the stakeholders, teasing them within the first 45 seconds whenever you present. Mm. I think about that for any type of presentation. How do you tease someone within that first 45 seconds? So thinking about what can you explicitly talk about one of their, like their, the business goals? Can you talk about the big picture? Do you even understand big picture what's happening? If not, how can you really understand the big picture, how your designs fit in that bigger picture? Can you talk about threats that they weren't aware of? Can you tease a solution, right? So how are you able to incorporate some of this to kind of lure them in with things that they're actually interested in very quickly? Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that. Like giving them a little tease or a little taste of like what's to come to like hook their attention. Um, yeah. I, I have been in situations with like these stakeholder reviews where like conversation kind of gets off the rails. You run out of time. Oh, I had so many more slides. We didn't get to it. Um, you know, I think there's an element of like timekeeping and ensuring it's not just one voice always giving the feedback and kind of like facilitating discussion. Um, any advice on how to do that as the presenter? I feel like sometimes it's it's a lot to try to like present and also facilitate and also time keep and also take notes. Um, so in the past, I've like reached out to colleagues to like kind of help in like, hey, can you help take notes for this meeting? Or, hey, I'm going to dedicate so and so as timekeeper for this meeting. Um, what are some other things that that maybe could work in this situation, if any? Yeah, some things that I've done, because I've definitely had a lot of interruptions during my mm. presenting. <laughs> and so something I'll do is before we get started, I will show a couple slides of how this meeting is going to go. Okay. So I'll say, okay, perhaps uh, depending on the type of meeting, if I'm presenting some final designs, I'm going to say, so I'm going to share some designs with you for five to 10 minutes. And I ask that it be completely uninterrupted. And if it's a fit, if it's in person, I give people post-it or paper and pens. Like if you have feedback, notes, thoughts, please place them here while I'm yeah. presenting. And then I will pause after 10 minutes. So it's not like a monologue for 45 minutes and like <laughs> you never get to talk about it. I'm going to pause after 10 minutes and I'm going to open it up for feedback for 10 minutes. And in that period of time, I'm going to have a certain certain types of questions that I'm going to ask during that. Like, does, mm. do you feel like this solution is meeting business needs? Um, is this going in the right direction? So I have specific questions that I'm asking during that feedback period. The other thing that I'm doing during that period that I'll tell them up front is when you have feedback or something you want to share, I would also like for you to tell me the motivation behind that feedback. This helps me as a designer understand a little bit more of the business, um, of the business strategies behind things that I might right. not be privy to, right? So that again helps us be in a more even playing field. The other thing I tell them is I'm also going to, if you I'm also going to open it up and let you know why that design decision may have been made. Because I'll tell them up front, like, I'm not just exploring one design decision. I'm thinking a lot of different things. There's a lot of research. There's many reasons why something is the way it is. So I want to express some of those things to you so that you also understand mm -hmm. um, everything that's gone behind that decision so that when we start to come up with solutions, you're not bringing up things that I've already thought about. You're yeah. not picking us down rabbit holes that I'm already aware of so that now we are in the same even playing field before we start really diving into solutions and brainstorming together. Yeah. I feel like that's so important and a part that's often rushed through right or like really quickly skipped through um yeah. but yeah making sure everyone has that context of what's been done and, and why and how we got to where we are now and the conversation we want to have now uh is, is really helpful and creates a more structured conversation uh a few folks uh reached out to me at knowing that this uh topic was coming up in a live stream uh and wanted to know how to 
respond if someone asks you a question that you don't have the answer to. I feel like this this can happen and can really shake your confidence, um, especially depending on if it's coming from a boss or like someone higher level up. We feel like we need to have an answer, right? And that like, if we don't know, it makes us look bad. Um, what do you think? How would you respond to this? And, and how can folks maybe feel a little bit more confident uh, addressing this kind of question? Yeah, you're just like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I think, I don't know. Um, yeah. I, th- I think that what I, my go-to always, anytime I'm asked a question, I feel pressure. I feel a little anxiety. I feel a little stress. Yes. I don't feel like I know everything. My go-to is like, oh, that is such an excellent question. I'd love a little time to think about it. And I'm going to get back to you later today or tomorrow. Um, and then I just kind of move forward. Like, yeah, you know, we like, don't need okay. to answer it right now. <laughs> right. So um, that's, that's my go-to for any time I feel uncomfortable is, is to really allow myself to collect thoughts or maybe you're like, I need some time to talk about so-and-so. Maybe you need a little more data or information from another yeah. team member. And so you just address that. Oh, that's a great question. I'm going to talk to Jake about that. We'll, we'll discuss and we'll get back to you. Right. So real casual, like, you know, like, oh yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I feel I, I totally agree. I feel like sometimes this can uh, be kind of cultural too. Like, is is there this cultural expectation or pressure to like answer every question, like, and, and resolve it in that meeting? Or do you have that culture of like, thank you, we'll take it away, we'll discuss, we'll come up with a response, and we'll get back to you? Like, what is that culture of like closing those loops and answering those questions? Um, I think is can also like affect like how you, how you address the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's also, it's challenging because not every person is a think on your feet type of person. Some of us, all of us at some point need time to think about it and reflect, to come up with a really thoughtful answer. So that's something else you can think about saying too, is, you know, I, I'm someone who likes to really think of and have a really thoughtful response. So I'd like that time to think about. So just giving them a little piece of, of who you are and, and yeah. you understanding yourself is also something that's respectable. Yeah. Uh, Carly actually just brought up a question in the chat, very related to this around like, what if this is in the context of a job interview? So maybe you get asked a question in a job interview and you're, you're stumped. You don't know how to respond or, or you don't know the answer. It, what would you do in that situation? Would you handle that differently versus like a more internal presentation or what would you do in that scenario? So I think that I would answer it somewhat similarly um, during an interview as well. Mm-hmm. I don't think that it really changes much. Um, you can still be like, I'm this type of person that needs a little bit more thought or would like to have a little bit more thought on yeah. that. So I'll get back to you on that. And that's totally okay during an interview, 1000%. Um, I think that, I think we feel even more pressure during an interview to oh, answer yeah. everything. And you don't want to be doing that right, left and center. Like, oh, I don't know. Let me get, I don't know about that. I'll get back to you. I don't, right. So if you use it one or two times during the interview, that's completely okay. Right. Yeah. Um, so maybe use it when you actually really don't know, something. Don't, <laughs> don't abuse it. And they're going to be like, this girl doesn't know anything. <laughs> um, so I think that, that that's totally okay to use. I, I, yeah. I don't know really any other tactics because mm-hmm. you don't want to fake it as you right. Cause then they are going to see right through it. You don't want something that you can do is you side sweep. You, you do the politics, you know, politician response, <laughs> where you're like answering it kind of in another way. Yeah. So they're like, you know, you, oh, what was the biggest hurdle with, um, that you've had with a developer or an engineering team, whatever it is. Mm. And you've never worked with an engineering team. You're like, oh, you know, actually a problem that I recently had with a product, my, this, my product manager <laughs> was, and you talk about yeah. that, how you overcome that. And you see what happens. Like maybe it just kind of rolls over yeah. or they ask you again and you're like, yeah, let me think about that. I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but I'll get back to you tomorrow. And then you like jot down notes. Like I'm going to get back to yeah, you. Yeah, you, yeah, know, yeah. you write, you're writing that question down. You'll get it back to them. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I like, I like both of those approaches. Um, <laughs> kind of like on this topic, I guess what happens after the presentation? We've talked a lot about like preparing. We've talked about like, giving the presentation. What about afterwards? Is there any sort of like 
best practices you feel for like following up or like turning action items into next steps? Like how do you carry on the conversation if needed afterwards? Yeah, I guess it just depends on the type of presentation that we're doing. Um, If there's something around, you know, we're presenting some final work, there are some recommendations that I've made, then from there during that meeting, and again, I haven't had a mostly an agency experience, right? So it's a little bit different from other people. But at the end, I said, these are my recommendations. Let's set up another meeting time to follow up on these recommendations. And I'm going to send you this deck and we'll, um, and we'll discuss that it further. So I, I'm typically someone who does a lot I'm better in person. I'm better over face to face. I also feel like from an agency perspective, it's better to have face to face than for you to um, try to do everything through email, especially because Mm. sometimes with my recommendations means there's a cost to things that we're talking about. So the better we can verbally discuss, the, the better. So those are kind of things that I do with my clients. Um, with team members, it's uh, always, I have a, an after presentation discussion where we talk about what were our biggest takeaways from this presentation. Okay. Um, because sometimes what I hear in another teammate has heard is a little bit Different. different. So what are things that we heard? What are things that we think might have been even like implicit things that came up that we we want to like dive a little bit deeper into. Um, And then what are things that each of us are going to take, take over moving forward? So who's going to handle next steps for X, Y, Z, and who's going to follow up with the client, et cetera. So um, yeah, it just really depends on, on the type of meeting. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I find that, or I found like uh, at my previous company, there was like a shared process. And so there was this like expectation of like, after a presentation, you post an update in, in the relevant channel in Slack and like with a link to the mm. recording, here's the action items, the attendee, like list of attendees, things like that. Um, and my current company, it's a bit looser. It's kind of like up to the designer on like what process they want and how they want to continue, you know, moving the conversation forward. Um, mm. But I do generally find it's best practice, at least if it's something like a design review, to kind of summarize high level like here's what we heard, here's some next steps, here's the links to things or whatever um, can be can be really helpful. Also, like kind of what you were saying with you and your team members level set, like did we hear the same thing? Like I find that achieves that a little bit where it's like, okay, here's what we heard high level. And if that doesn't align with someone else, they'll be like, oh, actually, no, I thought I thought this was what, what we talked, like what, what the main topic was or whatever. Um, so mm-hmm. yeah, that's been helpful for me. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's it's cool to hear how other teams do it and how other um, teams deal with sharing information because the other yeah. challenge is, you know, when I if I send a stakeholder a long email after I send people, you know, here are the highlights. A lot of t- oftentimes it doesn't get read too, right? Mm. So it's it's like the challenge <laughs> of like where the whole meeting is not going to be watched necessarily by most people. Right. So how do you even keep those tips and the, the couple of the things really succinct for certain people or really exciting to to read or just a couple of notes? Biggest takeaway is X, Y, Z. Yeah. I always find that that's always the challenge when giving people that after meeting. Yeah, <laughs> no one wants to read I, a I novel. Mean, I don't read any. <laughs> yeah, I don't read a lot of post-meeting things unless it's just a couple bullet points. I'm like, what, yeah, yeah. What, what, what's what, what came out of this? <laughs> yeah, I think that I think that's fair. Again, like consider your audience, right? Are they going to have the time to read this? Like, what is the information they they need to know? The high level takeaway. Yeah. Uh, okay, great. We have a question in the chat from Jillian uh, who asks, "Any tips on being better at thinking on your feet when fielding Q and A in presentations?" This is where a lot of my anxiety stems from. Earlier, you mentioned meditation. Anything else? One of the biggest things that my group had taken away from our presentation course is improv. All of them Mm. loved the improv. So I incorporated a lot of that. I have a theater background as well. So I basically just brought meditation, my theater background, and my presentation all in one. So the improv is what, what people really liked because they're like, oh, 
I hate thinking on my feet yeah. and it feels really uncomfortable. I like to, some people really like to have everything thought through beforehand. So they're like, oh, I don't have any notes I can work off. People who are thinking, thinking about what they're going to say before they're going to say it. They are, they don't have that opportunity now yeah. because part of the improv practices is to receive, because if you are not listening, you're not being an active listener, you're not going to be able to respond appropriately. Right. So putting into practice a little bit of improv. You can even find improv things online that you can practice with. A, I do improv things with my husband. Like we'll be at a, at a bar. We're waiting for our drinks. What are five things you got in your wallet right now? Oh, a fish tank, a screwdriver, uh, a water <laughs> bottle, right? So we play these little games with each other and you can think of them as, as games to just, um, again, practice that skill within your brain. It's a, it's a skill that you can improve upon as you practice it more and more. So it's not like we're not able, some of us are not able to think on our feet. We, we are able, we just, you know, haven't maybe practiced it as much. Yeah. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is like practice, like we have to practice being in these scenarios and being in these situations and like getting comfortable with the uncomfortable and unexpected. Yeah, that's life, right? No, life is not yeah. sorted. It's not a movie. We things come out the blue. The crazy things happen. We have to like just kind of work yeah. with it. So yeah, yeah, it's 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 life. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have one last question for you. Um, which especially in in today's Zoom, lots of virtual meeting kind of world, um, I often find as a presenter, it's it's challenging to get the engagement sometimes, right? People are like distracted on their phone. They're like bored reading Twitter at the same time. Like you don't, you're not getting that visual engagement and those visual cues that people are actually listening. Um, a, I'm curious if you've experienced this too. And like B, do you have any advice for audience members? Like for people not presenting, but maybe on the other end, like how can we be better supportive listeners and participants uh, during presentations, especially in this sort of virtual setting? Yeah. Um, I recommend for as much as we can to have cameras on. Um, something that I, I always, uh, it's something I've been trying to put into a practice in, in my events. Anytime I invite people to things, I put cameras yeah. on or cameras off or cameras optional so that people know that when they show up, cameras are on. Right. Um, something else that I've been doing within my particular group is I ask from day one, I ask everyone to agree that they're going to be an active listener, that we're going to respect every person who is talking. And it's a skill too, to be an active listener is yeah. a practice as well. It's yes. hard sometimes. You're like, oh, thinking I'm going to do my presentation soon. I'm like, kind of like going off in this other, you're off in your own world. You're looking yeah. at other texts, right? So being respectful of other people when they are showing up mm -hmm. and they're presenting and they are being vulnerable perhaps is you want to give them the eye contact. You also want to think about um, not just staring at them, <laughs> right? We want to think about nods, smiles, yeah, acknowledging, right? Giving them that acknowledgement. If they ask a question, you respond in the chat. What crazy? You ask a question, <laughs> people respond. If they ask, hey, can I get a thumbs up on camera? You give them two thumbs up. You show up. Mm -hmm. The way you want other people to show up. And the, the more you do that, the more you'll see other people do that in yeah. your life, right? Show up the way you're showing up. So I think that's something we're not taught to do in, in work, in school or whatever is to come up and it's to come as an act, active listener and to make that a practice. But I think the, that the more we do it, the more we're going to be cognizant of ourselves as presenters as well. Um, the other thing you can do is to make sure as when you're as a presenter, you are asking people for feedback. You're asking the chat questions. You are showing up with the energy in the first few minutes that you want to receive as well. Right. So I always think about the first few minutes as some of the most impactful, important minutes of anything you do when you show up, you're presenting anything. You're coming in with a smile. Hey guys, super excited to talk about this, right? Or, hey, how's it going? You're showing up the way you want other people to show up. And you are setting the tone as the person who is on camera. 
And so even if you have to fake it a little bit, do a little meditation beforehand, do some deep breathing and you come in and you, you come in strong. I think about some of my favorite artists. There's this uh, Korean rapper I saw recently and she came out in the first like half, like the first few seconds, like, blah, blah, did it. Like came with the most amazing rap and just came off stage in the most amazing outfit and came with so much energy that the yeah. whole crowd within half a second was like, blah, was like, oh blah. yeah, it we're like, into this. Yeah. Power. It was like, and it taught me, wow, the yeah. first few seconds sets the tone for the rest. So just, just at least think about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I think, I think that's, uh, that's great. Cause you kind of tied this back to like, some of it falls on the presenter too, right? Like it's not all about the audience being an active listener. Like that's, that's obviously important, but it's also the presenter and setting the tone, setting the stage, bringing the energy, like that should help lift up that level of engagement, um, and acknowledgement. So yeah, this is giving me a lot of ideas and like things I want to try in my future presentations. Uh, yeah. So thank you so, so much for joining today on our live stream. Thank you to my everyone pleasure. who tuned in. Um, Elisa, where can people find you online? Is there a particular place uh, people can learn more about all of the, the wonderful things you're teaching? Yeah, you can. Um, I'm on social medias. I'm on all the socials, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, LinkedIn. Um, you can find me Elise underscore presents. I'm uh, Elise Laborn on LinkedIn. I can drop in some I just dropped in some links too in the chat oh, nice. um, to stay Thank connected. You. And you can also go to my site, Elise Presents. I forgot to put that. ElisePresents.com. So you can find me. There's not that many Elise's out there. So <laughs> <laughs> put Elise Presents in Google. You'll find me. I will find you. We'll find you. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so, so much. Uh, this was such a fun topic to talk about. And I, I'm sure a lot of people listening today uh, are walking away with something that they want to try uh, in their next presentation. So thank you yeah, so I much. So. Yeah. yeah. All right, everybody have a wonderful day and we'll see you in a future live stream. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Yeah, bye.